Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Uh, my name is Kate Bruns, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so pleased to introduce this event with Lauren Aguirre, presenting her debut book, The Memory Thief, and the secrets behind how we remember a medical mystery, joined in conversation by Deborah Blum. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our ever-expanding digital community during these unprecedented times. We host virtual events like tonight's five times a week. You can find our event schedule on our website at harvard.com events, where you can sign up for our email newsletter and browse our bookshelves from home. This evening's event is going to conclude with some time for your questions. If you would like to ask our speakers something, please go to the Q&A chat at the bottom of the screen where you can submit a question. We're going to get through as many as time allows for this evening. Also, just a reminder that if you would like closed captions, you can click the live transcript tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. In a couple of minutes in the Zoom chat, I'll be sharing a link to purchase tonight's featured book, The Memory Thief. If you'd like to support our store in a different way, I'll also be sharing a donation link for Harvard Bookstore too. I would just like to say a tremendous thank you for your patronage during these very strange virtual times. Your support makes this author series possible and really does ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. And finally, as you have likely experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues can arise. And if they do, I'm gonna do my best to resolve them quickly. So thank you for your patience and your understanding. So now I am very excited to introduce tonight's speakers. Science journalist Lauren Aguirre has used nearly every medium to produce award-winning journalism for PBS Nova, including documentaries, podcasts, short form video series, interactive games, blogs, and more. Her articles on memory and on addiction have been featured in the Boston Globe Stat, Undark Magazine, The Atlantic, and Scientific American. Uh, this book in particular was supported by a grant from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Program in Public Understanding of Science and Technology. Tonight, Lauren is joined in conversation by fellow science journalist, Deborah Blum, the author of The Poison Squad, The Poisoner's Handbook, Ghost Hunters, Love at Goon Park, Sex on the Brain, and The Monkey Wars. A recipient of the Pulitzer, Deborah now serves as the director of the Knight Science Journalism Program at MIT. Tonight, the two will be discussing Lauren's debut book, The Memory Thief, hailed by Science, Amer Science Magazine as extensively researched, cinematic, and accessible. Joining us tonight, Deborah praises the book, saying, The Memory Thief moves with the roller coaster speed of a first rate suspense novel, while simultaneously offering a deeply compassionate and insightful look at our understanding of what makes and what breaks human memory. We are so pleased to have them both here with us for this event tonight. So without further ado, the digital podium is yours, Deborah and Lauren. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm so honored to be here in part because I'm such a fan of the Harvard Bookstore and in part because I'm such a fan of this book. And Lauren, when I first got a look at your book, I, I found myself deeply annoyed because a lot of times I can just skim through a book and go on to other things, but I got sucked into your story so often that it actually interfered <laughs> with some of my work over at the Night Science Journalism Program. So this is me saying I'm very happy to be talking to you about this book. And I want to start by saying, and your book reminded me of this, sometimes neuroscientists we'll talk about the brain as a black box, still mysterious, and memory as an e even more mysterious part of what happens in the brain. And, and your book reminded me uh, of both that mystery and, and of the detective work that goes on to try to solve it. So I'm hoping that we can start this with you reading a brief excerpt that sort of illustrates some of the detective parts of this and then go on to the conversation. Great. So this uh, is a scene from early on in the book. On the first Friday of October, Barish leans forward in his chair and stares at the MRI scan on his monitor. He's looking at the brain of a young man admitted to the hospital last night, and the image is so strange and beautiful that he knows something has to be wrong. Whoa, he says out loud to his empty office. 
This is weird. Floating brightly against the darker background of the rest of the brain are two C-shaped structures tucked on either side of the central fluid-filled cavity. Together, they make up the hippocampus, the place that holds the keys to memory. And the intense glow is a distress signal from many millions of cells. Some mysterious marauding force has laid waste to just this tiny region, leaving the rest of the brain unharmed. Barish looks out his door to the still quiet waiting room up on the seventh floor at Leahy Hospital and Medical Center in Burlington, Massachusetts, just outside Boston. Then he looks back at the monitor. Last night's phone call from nearby Winchester Hospital requesting permission to transfer this patient suddenly makes more sense. The distraught 22-year-old had recently overdosed. He was dragging one leg and repeatedly asking his mother if he was dying. Winchester is a smaller hospital that handles routine emergencies, like a broken wrist or an appendicitis. But when patients with complex conditions or unexplained symptoms come in, the staff will often send them over to Leahy, a facility that has hundreds of specialists and more equipment. With a high quality image in front of him, Barish can see what the Winchester staff could not, and it explains why the patient was acting strangely. In 10 years of medical training, Barish has reviewed thousands of scans, brains shrunken from Alzheimer's disease, brains dotted with tiny broken blood vessels, brains with tumors in different sizes, shapes, and locations. In every case, no matter what the damage looked like, it was pretty clear what was going on. But what Barish sees on the screen in front of him is strange and alien, belonging to no category he can imagine. It looks like someone took a page out of his medical school neuroanatomy textbook and deliberately highlighted the brain's memory center. He re-examines the MRI, scrolling up from the base of the skull through the familiar soft gray brain structures until the hippocampus comes back into view. It seems certain that this patient will fail the memory test they'll give him today. And the damage has triggered Barish's interest in strange cases and rare brain diseases. He believes more in chance than in destiny, but still, he thinks, it's almost as if his years of study and obsession have guided him directly to this moment, sitting in this office, looking at this startling image. So I think that that excerpt gives everyone who's watching here a sense of the uh, description of your book as being cinematic. But let's sort of, not to overdo the image here, but let's sort of widen the lens a little. Jer uh, Barish is Jed Barish. And I'm wondering if, before we go any farther, you can just talk a little bit about who he is and, and explain a little bit of some of this way that he starts and, and, and starts building this sort of mystery detective part of your book. Okay, so first I should say that um, Jed Barish is, is a friend of mine and, and um, we sort of share a fascination with weird brains because I have a, a somewhat weird brain. I suppose we all do, but um, I sought his opinion for a neurological problem and he was extremely helpful. So Barish is really a, um, he's a puzzle solver. He also happens to have trained as an epidemiologist so um, he really looks for patterns and tries to explain, well, when you see something new, you know, he's a sort of disease detective or a syndrome detective, in addition to being a neurologist. When you see something new, um, how do you make sense of it? So for him, when he saw this first patient that I described, it was, well, this is weird. Um, and this is what we know about what happened to him, but there really wasn't enough to go on it uh, to, to say, what actually caused that very unusual damage. It wasn't until he saw the second case when he noticed a link and he said, okay, there's, there's a link with both of them with heroin use, but people have been using heroin for decades. What's changed? Well, what had changed was in 2012, fentanyl had started to work its way into the drug supply in Massachusetts. So that was the new thing. So then really the rest of the book, he's setting out to find out if his hunch is right. And it's much harder than it would seem on the surface of it to figure that out. 
and he builds a kind of network of people who are equally both puzzled and fascinated by this particular syndrome, mostly in Massachusetts. I mean, the story isn't only set in Massachusetts, but its heart is really with this mystery that begins here, I say, because I'm living in Boston. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so um, it's also a very interesting story because it's kind of science on a shoestring budget or really no budget um, because it's this weird syndrome that doesn't fall in anyone's particular area. It's not part of someone's research project. It crosses two areas, you know, addiction and opioids and memory. So, um, you know, part of his job was really roping in other people who had the expertise that he didn't have and the resources that he didn't have. So that was sort of years of late night emails to anyone he could think of who might be able to help um, and cajoling and badgering um, until he was able to pull together people who could help him solve the mystery. Yes, that was one of the things that I liked so much about it is you start seeing all these different people who have different parts of the puzzle and you know, trying to connect the dots essentially in making this work. Let's back up a little bit though, because one of the things, and this struck me again in looking, uh, in reading your book, is that our understanding of memory, I'm not sure this is a good thing or a bad thing, and you can contradict me too. But it strikes me reading your book and, and, and from other books I've read that much of our uh, understanding of memory comes from injury, injury to the brain, injury to memory. And we don't go and seek that in humans. So a lot of times, and this is why Barish's fascination with these two cases to start with, and I know it gets to be more, is so interesting to me because a lot of times it's really just one case. Mm -hmm. So to go backwards in history a little bit and to talk both about the hippocampus itself and why it's so important, but a single case, one of the uh, moments in history that you reference is the very famous case in neuroscience of HM. And I wonder, because that was such a breakthrough moment in memory, if you would talk a little bit about that and also a little bit about how they led us to the central feature of, uh, of this sort of group of detectives who are looking at damage to the hippocampus uh, to recognize the role of the hippocampus in memory. So um, the famous story of HM, uh, who was later revealed to be Henry Melissen, I assume that's what you're talking about. Yes. Um, so he had a really terrible epilepsy and um, they couldn't treat it with medicine. And finally, in a last ditch effort to save him, um, a sort of swashbuckling surgeon decided to remove both of his hippocampi. Um, there was good reason to think that that might work because the hippocampus is a very vulnerable region. It's a very excitable region and it's very prone to seizures. Um, but no one knew what it did. Um, and if, if you think about it, removing like both of a, of a whole brain structure, it's got to do something was, was risky, but you know, they, they were hoping to save his life. So it wasn't until he woke up in the hospital and kept asking his mother where the bathroom was that they realized that they had really hurt his memory. So he was studied extensively for the rest of his life by Brenda Milner and Suzanne Corkin and others who really were able to tease out you know, we talk about memory, the memory that most of us talk about that we care about is the memory that our hippocampus um, shapes and creates. It's, it's the memory for things that you know you know, whether it's events or facts or episodes from your life that are, you know, stories that you can remember. So um, he lost the ability to create any new memories of that sort. But he was able, he had some procedural memory, meaning he could learn how to do things that were like motor skills. But he, he would never like recognize another new person. Um, you know, he, he didn't know Suzanne Corkin despite having worked with her for decades. So um, yes, his misfortune was, was a boon to science. Yes, and it also, and I am glad you talked about the hippocampus itself. Obviously, there are 
you know, a number of kinds of memories, right? But but we do look at the hippocampus as this kind of central structure. And it's not just because of HM, it's because of, you know, work that followed in that sense. But um, there is another character in your book, Owen, who, and I, th and I should say, when I came up in science journalism, uh, HM's name was not revealed. And so when you would go into the papers, and that was a more recent um, decision. And, and a lot of times in these kinds of journals, scientists will protect the identity of a test subject by just using their initials. So to this day, my hippocampus insists on calling him HM. And that's <laughs> of him. Um, I've always felt so sorry for him, right? And, and he's part of a group of cases in which damage to the brain, there, this is not the same thing, but there was a famous case of a worker named Phineas Gage who had a iron bar that accidentally was forced right through the frontal cortex of his brain and allowed, and that injury again, single injury, but allowed people to start to recognize, the, you know, what part of the brain helped deal with impulse control. Um, so HM was hugely influential, but you actually follow a patient. And in fact, and I love this, he writes an essay at the, an invited essay at the end of your book, Owen, um, who you draw some parallels to HM and in the way that his condition helps us understand memory and how injury uh, affects memory. And I wonder if you would just talk a little bit about him as a case study, not only in you know what we see in these glowing, amazing images of the hippocampus, but what we see in the way that these kinds of in injuries affect people's lives. Yeah. Well, he's really a remarkable person. And I, I was so grateful that he was willing to share his story with me for the book. Um, and he you know, so he overdosed after 18 months of sobriety um, on fentanyl and um, woke up in the hospital with this injury. Um, but because he had actually long cared about memory and um, had studied memory in college, he understood immediately when the doctor said you injured your hippocampus, what it meant for him. Um, and to this day, he still can't remember where he parked his car he can't remember that his, um, you know, his best friend might have broken up with his girlfriend the day before. Um, but because he is an incredibly organized person and has incredible executive function, he actually has managed to rebuild his life and um, has a job and takes classes at a community college. So he's really just a testament to not to sound Hallmark Cardi, but resilience um, and you know the ability to carry on. And he was also very generous in agreeing to participate in this research at the University of California, San Francisco Memory and Aging Center. Um, and so there they learned, they did some very tailored MRI scanning through a, a strange confluence of events. He had actually had an MRI scan just before his overdose. So they knew what his brain looked like before the overdose. Then there was imaging done right at the time of the overdose that showed that glowing image I described before of just the hippocampus. And then he came back to UCSF um, and they, they um, measured the volume of his hippocampus and it had shrunk by 10%, which is as much as a 60 year old would lose in a decade. And they also did this very detailed um, um, testing of his memory and other cognitive functions. And again, his, what is called episodic memory, his explicit memory for numbers or events, um, he scored on par with someone with Alzheimer's disease, but the rest of his cognitive function is perfect. So, um, so you know, what his case really showed is that fentanyl can zero in on just this one structure in the brain just the hippocampus and damage it. And this was completely unrecognized. Actually, I'll correct myself. There was an anesthesiologist who did recognize that and had done research for 20 years and finally gave up because no one wanted to fund it anymore. 
but it, it was really not not at all well known. So, so now the question becomes, now we know that opioids can damage the hippocampus, can we turn that insight around and use that knowledge to find ways to protect the hippocampus? And I want to zero in on that point, that, that sort of precise point of mechanism of injury for a minute, and then open it back up uh, to other issues in memory, leading us maybe even to, as you mentioned, the comparison between uh, the memory effects that are comparable to Alzheimer's. Um, so lots and lots of people have uh, been prescribed fentanyl or, you know, abused illegal versions of the same. And yet we don't see an epidemic of memory loss in a exposure to person one-on-one -on -one kind of way. You know, the, the numbers, yeah. that, even in your book, and there's probably more since the book, you research the book, but still we're not talking about what anyone would talk about is like a, uh, I don't, not a pandemic, but an epidemic, right? Do right. we, do we, and has the research been done? Because I always find this part of what, and this will actually, I think relates to Alzheimer's, what causes the damage to memory? Do people understand that? Why this is so case specific? What is it about fentanyl? So there's two questions in there. One is what causes the damage? And then the second is, why does it not happen to most people? Yes. So uh, the first one, how does it cause the damage? It gets a little bit wonky, but basically there's two main classes of neurons in the brain. There's the excitatory neurons that we think about that just they get enough input and they fire and they pass the message along. And those represent the majority of neurons in the brain, but they're also called inhibitory neurons. And their job is to actually manage everything. They're like the bouncers at the bar and they keep things under control. So when they're out of commission, you have chaos. And that's what happens with fentanyl is it locks onto these specific opioid receptors on the inhibitory neurons and it shuts them down. So they're out of commission and then the excitatory neurons are firing wildly out of control and, and burning up more energy than they have. And this is compounded by when people use opioids, um, not in a hospital setting, let's say, it, it um, suppresses the drive to breathe. So they're also usually somewhat hypoxic. So that just exacerbates the problem because they're not getting enough you know, oxygen to this vulnerable structure. So that's, that's the idea of the mechanism of damage. But why it doesn't happen to most people is definitely still a mystery. So it could be a genetic predisposition that's rare. It could be a prior use. Um, it could be, you know, for example, Owen had used drugs since age 11, um, but had been um, sober for a year and a half. So was it the prolonged use followed by sobriety, followed by a dramatic overdose that was the problem for him? Is it uh, vascularization? Is it how different people's hippocampus is fed in different ways by the blood supply? So that they really don't know. And, and that will be very hard to tease out just because there are so few people. And yes, you're right. There are probably many more people than we realize, but even so they're few. And then I also want to uh, speak to your point about, um, let's say fentanyl is used in, in anesthesia every day in 80 to 90% of surgeries. And clearly this doesn't happen to those people. Um, but th those people are two things. They're supported with oxygen, but they also that drug is given with another drug that counteracts this sort of excitatory effect of oh. fentanyl. So it's, it's protective. Oh, that's reassuring. <laughs> yes. But also the kind of, and I think, you know, it's a question that goes way beyond this into all of the different diseases and, and responses to diseases that we see, you know, what, what's the individual response and what is the more general response? So, so still many mysteries involved here, which leads me to uh, branch out into other issues of memory. You know, I, let's talk about memory and then go, um, 
and sort of expand this to something that probably people think of as an epidemic, which is Alzheimer's, so diseases of memory, right? Which is, you know, the more we understand memory and how it works and what triggers injury and how we best treat that injury, you can generalize out from way beyond, well, this person, you know, abused fentanyl to, well, what about this vast series of unknowns about memory and that would certainly include our understanding of Alzheimer's right um, and I don't know if myself I would describe Alzheimer's as an epidemic because it's always a is it just that we're able to do better diagnostics and so we're more aware of this specific condition um, but certainly Alzheimer's and, and, and other dementias that affect memory um, why do they matter so much? And I think it's not just about daily function, but you know, I've also, and this gets back to the sort of core of the memory issue, are we our memories, right? We're able to, you know, it's great to know where you left the car, right? And all of those sort of navigate through daily life stuff. But in the more existential, who are we? Are we in fact our memories? Why does this matter so much? Yeah, um, we, we are our memories. I'll, I'll go back briefly to the neurological episode that I referenced in the beginning because it's part of what drew me to this story is I had an episode where I lost my memory for a couple of minutes, meaning I had no idea where I was, what century it was, or who I was. Like if you had asked me my name at that moment, I couldn't have told you. And so there was no connection to the past, the present, the future. And that was deeply, deeply terrifying because yes, without your memories, you actually don't feel like anyone. Um, you know, I, I, I wanna sort of soften that a little because there's still, you know, even someone with severe memory problems still feels love, you know, and connection. So, it, you know, it's not sort of as black and white as I described it. But memory is also, you know, we think it's about remembering the past and, and who we are, but it's also about imagining the future. And this was one of the more interesting experiments that I, I talked about in the book, which is um, a woman, Eleanor McGuire in, in London, worked with uh, people with severe amnesia, also damaged to the hippocampus and people who weren't damaged. And um, she found, so she asked all of them, you know, tell me about a day at the beach, like look around, what do you see? So the people who didn't have the memory problems told a whole story, you know, there's a boat going by and I hear the seagulls and, you know, lots of details. And the people with the damage to the hippocampus, there's nothing, I mean, they know from, you know, they know conceptually that there's white sand and a blue sky, but that's really all they can say. When she probes them and says, what else do you see? They say, you know, that that's it, I'm kind of floating. So they can't imagine something. They can't create a new scene out of their, their mind. And that's part of what makes us so human and who we are is imagining things that don't exist yet and projecting yourself into the future. So it's as much about having a future as, as having a past. That is such an interesting point. I hadn't thought about that, the sort of backwards and forwards nature of life regarding memory. So when we look at, I, I'm sort of making a, a huge leap over to uh, the larger memory related diseases by opening up the Alzheimer's box here. Um, if, if we look at the complications and effects of Alzheimer's, do you yourself see parallels in how uh, Alzheimer's affects the brain and how um, this particular condition affects the brain? Or is it more or less, you know, here is another issue in which we see the way memory uh, it is so central to our lives and we don't understand best how to protect our memories. Yeah, well, there are some parallels which um, I, I wasn't aware of between this, what's called the opioid associated amnestic syndrome and Alzheimer's, which wasn't really clear very early on, except for the fact that they both target the hippocampus. 
So in, in most forms of Alzheimer's disease, the hippocampus is where the damage first begins. So that's why in most cases, memory loss is, is the first sign and then the damage spreads out from there. Um, but going back to those excitatory and inhibitory neurons and that imbalance uh, between them that can be damaging, that is also known to be a feature of both aging and especially in um, the phase before Alzheimer's disease. It's called AMCI, amnestic mild cognitive impairment. So in the hippocampus, there is this imbalance and there's a little too much activity and that actually makes it very difficult to encode memories. It's bad for memory formation. So that is actually a, a new target for treatment is drugs that can kind of tamp down that hyperactivity. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And are those still in, I ask as a geeky science writer, kind of in early test phase or are, are they moving sort of through the clinical trial process towards something that might actually be used? So the, the, the one I describe in my book is actually a modified version of an off the shelf um, epilepsy drug, not too surprisingly, um, but a, a tiny dose of it. And that is in a, a phase 2B slash three, it's a, a new designation, but basically it's the protocol of the phase three trial. It's a smaller group, but if the results are, um, are good, the FDA could approve this drug. And that, that would happen in late 2022, if it works. So it, it's fairly far along. And of course it's easier when you're starting with a drug that is known and you don't have to go through all this testing to you know, determine if it's safe or not. And I want to come back at some point, and I expect there might be some interest in, in the issue of how the FDA uh, decides to approve treatments. Let me ask you, I mean, at this point, I don't think I, I, both the brain and memory, going back to my black box analogy, even though we can look at structures like the hippocampus and say, well, these play central roles, you know, I, I wouldn't say that we've written the book on how memory works. You can contradict me. You know more about this than I do. And I wouldn't say that we have written the book on understanding what causes or triggers or fully plays roles in memory loss either. Yes, I disagree. I would say you, you are absolutely right. We have not written the book on either of those things, um, you know, and there there is no hammer of truth and, and sort of every every finding comes with asterisks and caveats and it's sort of hopefully a little bit closer to understanding the full picture, but it's always incomplete. Um, and that's one of the reasons I actually love these stories of scientists who recognize the importance of the Henrys and the Owens and the Phineases and all of these different case studies, which remind us, I think, because you can say, well, this one case really tells us something that we've got these, uni we've got both these sort of individual varied response to injury or assault, but we also have these universals about how the brain works. Mm -hmm. So going back to Alzheimer's for a, for a minute, when, when, when you think about Alzheimer's and, and the way that it affects memory, you, uh, how do you, I mean, what do you see as the primary loss? What's your best understanding of some of the mechanisms and and I'm going to very shortly start, we've got a few questions already in the Q&A, and I do want to encourage people if they have questions about memory or Alzheimer's or anything in the book, you know, this is a great moment to add them into the Q&A, but uh, talk about Alzheimer's a little bit, and I'm curious as to whether working on this book made you um, think about Alzheimer's in a different way or feel that you understood it uh, or, or understood its impacts in a way you hadn't thought about before? Well, I hadn't actually really thought about Alzheimer's before. And I, I think that's, that's true for many of us because by the time someone has Alzheimer's, they're usually 
you don't see them, they don't go out. So they're, they're invisible unless you know someone who has it or you know someone who's taking care of someone with, with Alzheimer's. Um, but, you know, we know a lot about Alzheimer's, but, but we, science, the world, don't know what causes it. So that makes it very, very hard to treat. So it's known a lot of features of Alzheimer's or what they call biomarkers like these toxic proteins that build up in the brain, the amyloid plaques and the tau tangles and the hyperactivity and the inflammation and where the damage is. It's possible to see all those things, but how that process got started is believed to happen way, way earlier. And it's not clear why it begins. And, um, and there may not be a cause, there may be multiple causes, there may be multiple on ramps to this disease. So it, it's very hard to figure out the cause because it does happen so early and, it, and it's a disease of aging. So there's a ton of other things going on in the human brain at the same time. And many people of Alzheimer's disease might have some other disease as well. They might have some cerebrovascular disease. So it, it can be sort of hard to, to tease apart. You know, I mean, you're right that I think we think more about Alzheimer's uh, if there's a personal connection. Most of us actually hope to go through our lives with no connection at all, I think. I, I'm going to briefly mention mine, and that's going to allow me to segue uh, into personal stories, which is one of the questions I've got in the Q&A here. Um, which is that uh, my favorite aunt, uh, who was also the smartest person in her family, right? always super sharp, is the one person, uh, this is my father's side of the family, who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Um, and so I was shocked, actually right, of the Sibs in that family, of all the people that I would have predicted to have ended up with an Alzheimer's memory disorder, my aunt was the last person for me on that list. Um, and, uh, and I'll add that, um, you know, due to COVID-19, which also comes up in your book in the way that it, you know, is, has been research disruptive, in some ways, um, the things that aren't focused on infectious disease. Um, she ended up in a memory care unit that, uh, that was locked down due to COVID and that did not go well. So I have very strong feelings about Alzheimer's. I have a question here um, that, uh, that is related to uh, something that you raised in the book, um, also personal. Lauren, can you say more about your own experience with amnesia? What is it that, what is what caused it understood? Did your memory simply return? Now we're talking about personal experiences with memory again, or what happened? So um, what happened is it turned out that it was a type of seizure um, that is caused, it was caused by a brain lesion. So I went through a lot of the testing that, for example, Owen Rivers went through um, after, after his injury. And I got, um, I was advised to have surgery by um, the chief of neurosurgery at a Boston area hospital. And I didn't like that idea. So I, I got a lot of second opinions and I was um, told by neurologists to just hang tight and take some medicine um, and I'd be fine. And that has been the case. I've had tons of MRIs, you know, that lesion is still there. So fortunately for me, um, it was a one-time event, um, and you know I'm I consider myself ex extremely lucky. And and did that like add some depth though of understanding or inspiration for you as you worked on the book? Yes, definitely. Both in terms of you know that period of not knowing what was happening was so scary. And, um, you know, even if you get a really bad diagnosis, there's something about being able to put a name to it that is reassuring. And then knowing that there are other people who are suffering in the same way is reassuring. And that's what people with this opioid associated amnestic syndrome were missing is what happened to me and why, and am I the only person out there? 
Right. No, that makes perfect sense. This is also, uh, this is a question from Patsy, also related to the people with the opioid related amnestic syndrome. Uh, it does sound though, as though fentanyl damages memory suddenly, whereas Alzheimer's disease is a slower development. Do we know of other chemicals that affect the hippocampus and memory suddenly or slowly, I suppose? especially after what we might call lifestyle chemicals? Um, well, not lifestyle chemicals that I'm aware of. There is another um, toxin that can damage just the hippocampus um, and it's called amnestic shellfish poisoning. And it's a toxin that accumulates in shellfish during algal blooms. Um, so similarly, it just zeroes in on the hippocampus and um, really damages it very severely. So people who suffer from that will have exactly the same kind of presentation. But in terms of um, the hippocampus, um, I'm not aware of any research that suggests there's a toxin that's particularly targeting it. It's really more when those two um, toxic proteins that are accumulating over many, many years in the brain, when they get together in the hippocampus, that's when the damage really begins. And then it spreads out from there to other brain regions. Although and I, I don't want, I got enough questions here that I don't want to go down this path too much, but you do make the point in the book that we do know of other exposures that uh, are implicated in neurological conditions such as Parkinson's, right? Yes, yes. Certainly memory, but definitely neurological, right, in, in the chemical right. effects. I have a series of questions related to art and craft and, and the telling of the book itself. Evan would like to know, how did Dr. Barish feel about having his story researched and publicized, and this is a complimentary question, in your great book in such depth? For example, he evidently turned over years of relevant emails to you. Can you tell us more about how that project worked? Right, so he actually didn't turn over the emails to me. It was the Department of Public Health that turned over the emails through a Freedom of Information Act request. Right. Um, but he and uh, one of the neurologists that he worked with very closely, Monroe Butler, did turn over their text messages, um, which were fascinating because they show the kind of back and forth and the evolution of ideas over the years um, as they tried to sort out, you know, what does this mean? What can we learn from Owen Rivers? You know, what are the implications? Could could this form the basis of a new mouse animal model for Alzheimer's? So, uh, I mean, actually, I was a little surprised that Jed Barish let me do this because he really doesn't like the limelight. Um, but I think he was very much motivated by wanting to get the word out because there are undoubtedly more people out there who just don't know what happened to them. Um, so, it, you know, it's possible that now more people will be aware of it. No, that makes perfect sense. This is a related question from Allison. Throughout the book, you include, speaking of text messages, text message exchanges, personal notes that Owen, uh, one of your main characters wrote, another primary source material. Uh, how did you choose what material to include and why did you want to include those personal snapshots? Uh, well, I'll take the personal snapshots first. You know, science, it sounds sort of silly, but science is done by people. And um, I think how science advances depends so much on people's personalities and how they think about problems and who they talk to um, and luck. So those text messages and those emails really revealed people's personalities and their persistence and how they thought about things in a way that would have been really boring for me to just describe in an omniscient voice. I think it was much more interesting to hear directly from, from those people. And of course there were tons of boring emails that I sifted through from the DPH. So you really have to choose <laughs> the ones that tell the story. I mean, even the story of your day, you're not gonna sit down and tell everyone everything that happened. You're gonna choose the highlights. 
Um, so that's what I did. That's just good writing. Um, and, and related to that, was there anything the really fascinating you learned during your research that ended up, so to speak, on the cutting room floor? A story you didn't tell. Well, I think it was more um, some interesting science that I learned, which I just could not work in because it, it derailed the story. But um, again, researchers at UC San Francisco who were just trying to see, can we image opioid receptors when they're being activated? And by accident, they found out that the opioids we take, so we have our own endogenous opioids. The ones we take are exogenous opioids like fentanyl and those actually behave very differently and go inside neurons. Mm -hmm. And they activate other, other receptors and they go into parts of neurons that regular opioids don't. And so I just thought that was fascinating because I always wondered, well, I mean, we already have opioids. Why are these so different? Well, yes. maybe that's why. I just thought that was fascinating. That is really interesting. So I, I'm going to go back to an interesting kind of question from Cindy here, which has to do with people who have exceptionally good memory and retention. Um, I mean, in fact, she is describing an 88 year old friend who has an incredible memory, uh, given the question of counting backwards by seven from 100, um, which I'm not sure I could do, uh, she totally nails that. And, and in other sort of cognitive tests or memory tests, she's all over it. I, I mean, I've heard, and, and I actually think about this myself, that, you know, when you get to be mem uh, middle age, I'm thinking not so much about diseases here, but just generally, uh, memory and longevity that, you know, we tend to lose some of our memory for nouns or names as we get older. Um, and, and I certainly see some of that in myself, sadly enough, right? I don't remember names as well as I wish I did these days. Do we understand not only like, you know, memory defects uh, and memory diseases, but do we actually understand any of the biology behind an exceptional memory? You know, that's a great question and I don't know the answer. I don't know if that's actually been been studied. Um, yes, so it, I don't actually, it's not something that I that I looked into. I definitely I actually met on one of my research trips someone like that who remembered every day of her life. She could go back and tell me what was happening and, and, and conversations and it was, it was wild. And, and she seemed perfectly happy. I mean, some people you hear about who have those exceptional memories, it's not necessarily a great thing to remember everything, but for her, it just seemed fine. She enjoyed it. Yes, I would love <laughs> actually that, I'm totally saying that should be your next book. <laughs> <laughs> Memory geniuses and their amazing stories. So I don't know if it'll be as good as this one, but it really is an interesting question. And, yeah. and related to that in a very pinpoint way, uh, here's another question. Is there any evidence um, that uh, memory exercises, games, crosswords, Sudoku, whatever, uh, actually uh, have any effect in preventing memory or enhancing memory, memory loss or enhancing memory? Yeah, so there's this concept called cognitive reserve, which is, you know, the ability for your brain to still keep functioning well, even in the face of damage that's happening. Um, so there is evidence that cognitive exercise is helpful um, in staving off memory loss and dementia, but it's not the kind of things like the crossword puzzle that you do every day or Sudoku it has to be something hard, you know, just like exercise. If you want to build new muscle, if, if, if you, you want the kind of cognitive workout that is thought to be helpful, it's, you know, learning a new language or really challenging yourself in some way. And it's also being socially engaged. So, um, you know, just having experiences, your brain needs input. It's also, you know, why um, having hearing loss 
is problematic because you're just not interacting with the world as much. Um, so anything you can do to basically be working your brain is a good idea. That's really helpful. And, you know, sadly reminds me of the, the many times that people say to me, there is no silver bullet for this. You actually have to do the work. Uh, I have a couple of book related questions and then I want, uh, which I hope we can get to, and then questions about, uh, and I expect you've gotten these before, uh, the new drug related to Alzheimer's that's been approved by the FDA, but let's do the book ones uh, quickly. Uh, are there other books about memory, amnesia, Alzheimer's that you recommend and related, be partly because I think the opioid discussion we had, have you read the new book about the Sackler family? And do you have any thoughts about that book? I have not read that book um, about the Sackler family. Um, you know, one of the books that I turned to early on that's an oldie but a goodie is The Seven Sins of Memory by Daniel Schachter, um, mm -hmm. because the concepts that he talks about in terms of memory and what it's for and how it fails us, you know, still hold true today. I think there's two recent books, um, The Problem of Alzheimer's by Jason Carlowish, if you really want to dig into Alzheimer's and also how how we should be caring for people with Alzheimer's. That one's very good. Um, there's a new book out about remembering called Remembering by Lisa Genova, who wrote Still Alice. That's really more focused on the, the science of memory. So if that's your interest. And then uh, one of the books that I read about addiction that I found really interesting is called The Biology of Desire um, by Mark Lewis. Mm -hmm. And that, that takes the, the position that um, addiction is as much a disorder of learning and memory as it is a disease. So oh, that's interesting fascinating. Book. I actually have to say that I really liked Still Alice and, and some of the points it made about memory and who we are, right? So yeah. I should definitely look at this. So the FDA, and this has been incredibly, at least in my geeky science writer community, incredibly controversial recently approved a drug uh, that was really targeting amyloid plaques as uh, one of the issues in Alzheimer's. And, and the approval process uh, actually caused three scientists on the advi FDA advisory board to quit the board because they were so unhappy about how it turned out. And yet there is a, are a lot of people who hope that this drug is gonna be helpful. So if we can finish up, you know, talking a little bit about that, that would be wonderful. Okay. Yeah, so uh, as you said, the advisory panel recommended against approval. And that is not to say that they know it doesn't work is to say that the evidence isn't there in their opinion to show that it does work. So many people were very surprised that it was approved because there've been 25 previous clinical trials targeting amyloid beta, so the same approach that also didn't work. So why this one finally was approved, you know, there are lots of ideas about why it was approved. Um, and of course, everyone wants, wants a drug to, to work, I, you know, I think, a concern that a lot of people have expressed is that this is going to make it harder to develop other drugs because there's already a shortage of people for clinical trials. And now that will be made worse because there will be so many people taking this drug that they then aren't available to try other things. Um, so that is a concern, you know, but it's also possible that because the FDA has approved this drug, people will feel more confidence in investing money and in coming up with other strategies. So there were, I mean, I, before this decision was made, I spoke with a lot of researchers who said, this is a great time in the field. Like we're finally truly optimistic about finding a treatment. You know, it's, it's a renaissance and, and we can see it three years, five years, 10 years. So I don't think people are gonna abandon all those other strategies. Um, and, uh, so, you know, I think despite all the concerns about this new drug, which I think are real, um, there's still a, a sense of optimism in the field about if not what the answers are, like they can see how to get to the answers so that we can develop treatments. That's a great answer. And actually makes me feel a little less bitter 
about the FDA decision, which I had sort of been shading that way. Are there, as we close this evening out, Lauren, other points that you think, you know, you would like to say about memory or are the in particular investigation, the secrets behind how we remember or, or points you'd like to leave our audience with? So, I mean, one of the things I really liked about this story is, again, it goes back to sort of personality and, and what drives science. So I think, you know, the, the case study is often sort of scorned in science. It's at the bottom tier of, you know, compared to sort of work with mice. It's considered sort of low level, you know, one-offs. But for me and for, you know, many scientists, those one-offs are the opportunity to say, what did we miss? Like when something doesn't make sense, it's either the observation was incorrect or we didn't know something that's important. You're seeing it for the first time. So, you know, what does it mean? And, you know, most people are, everyone's busy. So do you file it away in the back of your mind and move on? Or, or are you in a position to say, okay, I want to figure out what this, what this means. And, and sometimes, you know, it really unlocks a whole new way of, of understanding human health that is, that is really valuable. So for me, it's about the twin, sometimes opposing ideas of pay attention to things that make sense, don't make sense, you know, be open-minded, but also be skeptical and check yourself, you know, before you jump to conclusions. So you have to be both critical and, and, and open to new ideas at the same time. I think to be a great scientist, that, that's what you have to do. That's such a wonderful way to close this discussion. And I wish we could do it longer. You know, you've been great. And I, and I really want to thank everyone who uh, has stayed with us. We, yeah, people have just stayed through this whole discussion, which is always wonderful to see. And the questions have been so smart. So from my own perspective as someone who feels very lucky to come in and talk about a great book like this, thank you to everyone. Thank you. It was really great to be here. A great conversation. I'll just echo you both. Thank you once again, tremendously to both of you for sharing this discussion with us tonight and so relevant with the recent FDA decision as well. I'm really glad you touched on that. And thank you everyone to out, out there all over the country for spending your evening with us. Um, please learn more about the book and feel free to purchase The Memory Thief on harvard.com with the links I have spammed you with in the chat. So on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, have a great night, everyone. Please keep reading and be well. Take care. Thank you.